Hello. Hello there. Is that Salam Raimi? Sure is. Hi, how are you doing? I'm good, how are you doing? Yeah, very well, thank you. Very well indeed. Yeah, it's um, it was a sunny start to the day in London here, but it's been a bit of a cloudy finish, but never mind. It's a bit yeah. earlier in the day where you are, I think. Uh, yep, it sure is. It's on the early side. It's about 11 o'clock. About 11 o'clock. Oh, that's, that's, that's still great. That's good. You've got plenty of day left. That's wonderful. Yep. <laughs> well... Thank you very much for agreeing um, for us to uh, interview you today. That's very, very kind of you. And um, uh, do you mind if I start firing a few questions at you? For sure. Okay. Uh, I know that your your father was a uh, studio musician, Van Gibbs, and uh, I, I, I've sort of read uh, around that a little bit, but I know very little about what got you interested in music um when when you were younger i wondered if we could uh, talk about that a little bit right um well i mean i just grew up in it i mean basically my household was that my mom uh met my brother because my uncles on my mom's side were musicians and all my father's brothers were musicians as well so yeah. i pretty much came up in it i was playing drums you know a trap drum set that elvin jones made me by the age of three i was always playing on bongos um things were around for me to do you know just be exposed to it and you know the talent i think was in there it just took time for me to really hone in and decide this is what i wanted to apply myself to um and you know that happened by the time i was a teenager for me to really be on record level but still from birth i think it was already the music was there in the house at all points yeah yeah so so what age did you think you you made the decision that music was going to be your career what sort of age were you do you think I still didn't make it as a career decision until I was in college. Um, so I was still doing it. And, you know, it's like something I was into. I was playing drums and I was playing drum machines. But then um, when I graduated high school, I was in college for business management. And you know, before that, in high school, I was like in a vocational school where I took computer electronics, which is still related to the electronic music. Mm-hmm. Electronic, music ma- electronic Musician Magazine was my thing. And then I had my first album to do when I had a group called Jiggy on Polydor. Um, in 91 or so and at that time I was like okay you know what I'm going to take six months off of college to finish their album in time and you know if, if I ever get to a point where I don't have work for six months then I have to go back to college and that's never happened Wow, there you go. So who who would you say were your sort of biggest musical influences then through that time while you were at high school? Who Who, who were you kind of listening to? Um, well, I was a kid, uh, a hip hop kid in New York. Yeah. Um, so for me, it was like everybody that was in New York and doing, you know, all the different things. It was, you know, Molly Mall. It was 45 King. It was, you know, I'm in the 80s New York, BDP, you know, mm. EMD. Everything that was hip hop was really what I loved it. And then, you know, before that, it was my Curtis Blows. And my dad was working with the Curtis Blow and Fat Boys and Sugar Hill. So I just grew up. Um, you know, listening and loving all those different things. And, and that's really where the start of it, I think, is for me, um, just being a hip-hop kid. Wow. And that, that was what got you involved uh, originally with Curtis Blow through, through your father, was it? Uh, yes. Yes. That, I mean, my father was actually producing Curtis Blow, and then I actually helped him out with some records, and then that was my first real, co- um, you know, clear credits. Wow. I mean, you've, you've worked with some incredible names. I mean, Curtis Blow, Naz, Amy Winehouse, Miss Dynamite, Innie Kamosi, Tony Braxton, the Fugees. I mean, that's just scratching the surface compared to the number of names that are listed in your uh, discographies and, um, and um, uh, you know, your credits and, and so on. Um, so it has to be said that, that um, you know, it, that that is a huge amount and uh, can you can you tell us a little bit more about what it was like working with those people i mean to me it's like you know i couldn't have asked for the quality of talent that i've had the opportunity to work for work with in my lifetime um and a lot of those people weren't exactly who they became when i met them mm. so it's pretty much i just feel like it's just a path that i'm been able to continue to hone my craft and hone my skills by working with great talent that made me step up my game and then I was able to help them in some ways as well and throughout it that's just really what it is I think that um, 
overall the best opportunities that possibly could happen. I don't even know if they've happened yet. I, mean, I always look at the fact that mm. Quincy Jones worked on Thriller, you know, at a part of his career where he didn't know he'd be getting into <laughs> the sellers of his lifetime. He did that at 50 after he'd already done, you know, the jazz well, the scoring well and everything else. So I just still look at it like I still have the future in front of me. And it's not only as a producer, just as a talent finder and developer in general. Absolutely. Um, uh, just sort of a little more on that. I mean, if you take the lid off um, some of the tunes that you, you produced with these very famous people, I mean, they tend to be the tunes that, um, that, that are the big ones, you know, the ones that, uh, that, that everybody remembers for those artists. And um, it, it must be a, a great feeling for you to, to have attributed you know, and contributed to that, that success. Yeah, I mean, I, I look at myself almost like a record store or a DJ. You know, a great record store is always looking to find what he feels like someone else is going to want to buy. And that's kind of like they're curating it to their taste. So to me, at the core of every good record store, before it was record change, and even in record change, it would be the buyer. If mm-hmm. somebody tasted it, like, you know what, this is really good. I think people are going to get into this. And it's that, um, you know, boutique feeling of, hey, you know what? I'm trying to introduce artists I meet to music that I love, and then hopefully that will inspire something great from them. I'm trying to make records that feel as mm-hmm. good as things that I've loved throughout the course of time, mm-hmm. and hopefully somebody else will now get hip to it and go from there. And I think that's just really been the uh, bridge for me. You know, going through hip hop, where hip hop was so much of a take from classical blues, jazz, reggae, anything, and turn it into a current. Uh, diary of what's going on today in the artists' lives. Mm-hmm. It's the same factor. You know, taking that energy where Amy might have had doo wop music but she was talking about what she felt at that moment as that age of an eighteen or nineteen or twenty year old woman. Yeah. And the people of her age group appreciated it. And then at the end of the day the music was a backdrop to the emotion we wanted. And it's the same thing. I mean I just love the fact that the hip hop generation is able to pull from all types of generations and that's why it's lasted and will continue to last because you know there's no, it's almost like a melting pot that can come from anywhere. But the thing that comes out of it is urgent and is relevant to the people in the, in the audience very much. Well, yeah. I mean, you obviously create some kind of setting in which these artists are able to, to, to create. And, uh, you know, what is, what in your opinion is the, the, the recipe? What's your approach to, um, to, to starting with an artist, say, for instance? What is my approach to which part of it? Well, if you, you know, when you've got a new artist in a recording studio and, um, you, you know, you, you want to set this environment in which people excel and you obviously, you obviously do do that, um, you know, what's, what's your approach to that? Basically just finding out what they want to do, not what their company wants to do, not what their parents told them to do. Mm-hmm. Just give them a chance to have a voice and helping them find out how to... Uh, achieve whatever's in their head you know if they say you know what i really want to mix this with this this might sound crazy but these two things is really what i had in my mind and then for me it's an opportunity to just let them express themselves and figure out whatever picture that they're coming up with how to frame it so that actually it does fit on the wall so it does stand up so by allowing them to be as free as possible and then being supportive and putting things together that's the combination that ultimately works you know and then still once they actually are able to see their idea come out of their head and make it all the way to the finish line, then that inspires them to go further and to continue to do better with it. Well, so, so you give them freedom of expression and that is always a wonderful environment in which people can create and, uh, and be who they are. You know, that's, that's, that's wonderful. Exactly. Yeah. So your your personal album uh, release, which is uh, one one in the chamber, uh, is a truly fantastic piece of work. Can, we, can you tell us about the inspiration behind doing that project yourself? Oh yeah. I mean, some years ago, I did an album called Prognosis, mm. where I basically you know went to Prague with a bunch of beats and ideas that I had, and I hired orchestras in the Old Dolphinum and in smaller studios and. I was basically doing my composer's demo tape. I worked with Lalo Schifrin on Rush Hour 3, and it inspired me because I came up with the rhythm track and was playing the majority of the bottom instruments, but then he put the orchestra to it. And then I ended up making a song with Nas and CeeLo called Less Than an Hour over what we both did together. 
So being that I was inspired by how that was approached and how it came out, I was like, you know what? Where can I go and you know, just have, have a laugh? Let me see what I can come up with. Yes. So when I did that, a lot of the tracks that I came up with in Prague at that time became Jasmine Sullivan's Bush of Windows, became Nas's Queen Story, The Black Bond, just different records that actually came out for me were from, you know, me sampling myself from the orchestra work that I'd done. Yes. Then I was going to do a vocal version of it, but then I realized I'd use so many of the tracks. But after I did this initial piece of prognosis, I ended up recording orchestras, like, say, two or three times a year. I'd just do a session. I'd have some songs I wrote. I'd have some ideas, things that I worked on. And I'd be like, you know what? I actually do want to add another layer of this. I want to add a layer of gloss and figure out what I'm doing. So when I did that... Um, and really took a look at it. I was like, you know what? I have some songs here that I love that haven't actually come out or maybe they didn't fit the artists that I was working with this album, but it's great for me. It's something that inspires me. So what I decided to do was just to put it together as you know, my own LP, which at first I wasn't sure what I was going to call it. And then it just turned into being, you know, it's one in the chamber because I had the song one in the chamber. And it was just basically, you know, my first album is number one, and it's chamber music. Ultimately, that's really inspired me to even pull it together, the orchestral aspect, not just the musical aspect. Wonderful. Yeah, because, um, I mean, you've got some very, very big names on there, Akon, Neo, Lamar, uh, Jordan Sparks, just to name a few. I mean, mm-hmm. I mean, tell us about how that came about. Did you did you have an idea that they were the right people for those songs, or did it, did it grow organically? What, what was the thing there? Well, it's organically because these are all people that I work with anyway. Yeah. So I work with them on the songs. And then now, instead of the songs going on their perspective albums, it was just something I was like, you know what? I love this music. And as, you know, like I said, the record shop owner, as the curator of a radio station, as the curator of my own space, I was like, you know what? Let me put this forward and let everybody hear it. And, you know, I was like, hey, can I use these songs? And they were like, sure, great. I love those songs. I wish somebody could hear them because they necessarily didn't fit their products. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of orchestral work on there, as you've mentioned earlier, and um, yeah, really loving that, and it gives it a great feel. I mean, it's uh, it it's not unusual, but the way you use it is is a little heavier than perhaps I've I've heard it in in, in other uh, releases, and um, you know, and I think it works really well. I mean, what's behind that? Is that just a love of orchestral arrangement or? It was, it was just simply, it was more about the orchestral stuff in the song second, initially. Yeah. Just that my prognosis album was all instrumental. So really, this whole album was to be instrumental, and then the vocals would have been separate. I just realized I had so many with songs on it that I still love the songs that I actually would put this many on it. You know, my future albums may have less vocals, um, particularly because it's more about me as the artist just doing something that I feel is there, and I'm not a vocalist in that way. Yeah. Oh, that's my voice along with the other stuff. You know, the orchestral aspect to it is my voice within the music. And that works extremely well, uh, Salam. Very, very well indeed. Uh, I mean, it's a very varied album. I mean, you go from, uh, you know, the, the rumba type beat of of, uh, of uh, Livy, Livy's Place. Uh, then, you know, you've got some R&B in there. You've got some blues, some sort of traditional, more traditional blues feel to it. And a whole load of soul, and, and the whole thing just comes together very nicely with all of those fantastic vocalists as well. You know, from the instrumental tracks to the vocal tracks, you've got ballads, you've got, you know, it's all there. I mean, um, you know, w- was that intentional? Or is that just how the tunes came together? It's that, and I think also it's just a snapshot of what I normally do. Like, mm. you know, all things are records, are, like I said, I, I didn't write them, say I'm going to put them on the album. It's just part of what I do. It's part of my love of music. Um, even down to the instrumentals, you know, Levi's Place was done as part of the score for Sparkle mm. when I was in a movie that didn't come out. But then Rising to the Top is my favorite song growing up that I had the orchestra play just because I remember the days when Chuck Mangione had a hit with Feel So Good, and that was the sound of New York. So to me, Rising to the Top was the sound of my use, so I did it as an instrumental. Um, you know, in general, this is just the scope of what I write and what I listen to also, you know, the mini Ripperton flavor mm. in my mind, you know, that goes into the Curtis Mayfield flavor of making it hard for me wasn't intentional. It was just what I listened to. And then when Corinne and I just started talking about it, it naturally came out. So I'm inspired by that. You know, I listen to a lot of Marvin Gaye. So the C.J. Hilton 
as an artist and then what we came out with is inspired by that in some form or fashion i just feel like the music itself um it's kind of just step one of speaking towards who i am separately yes. as an artist that you even are because the artists do many different things but this is kind of this is where i appear on my weekend i go from jazz to blues to soul to hip-hop to whatever else it is and you know at this point i just feel like this is a step one and then you'll turn around and see another version of it that comes later that might be on a whole nother level. Well, that, uh, that sounds absolutely great. I have to ask about Chocolate Brown Eyes with Jordan Sparks as the vocals on there. I mean, wow, I just love the orchestral touch to that. And, you know, tell us more about that song. It's absolutely gorgeous. Well, actually, with Chocolate Brown Eyes, um, the first time I worked with it, met Jordan Sparks, I scored the movie Sparkle in 2012. Yeah. That actually, you know, was Whitney Houston's last film and stars Jordan as well. So um, I pretty much had written a theme that if you know, anyone was to watch the movie Sparkle, the guitar that's on the Chocolate Blind Eye song is the love theme throughout the movie. So everywhere that Jordan, you know, um, and gets together with Derek Luke and they're about to have, you know, a scene where they have the first kiss and everything else. Yeah. That's the theme of the whole movie. So I wrote Chocolate Brown Eyes to be something for that movie or to support it, to do the soundtrack. And, you know, Jordan actually sat down and wrote the lyrics. And that was our first collaboration on that level where I was like, look, you can do it. Just tell me what you want to say. Figure out the words you want to say. And then she also utilized another part of her voice that I really liked a lot. And that actual song just really stood up and made me go, you know what? Jordan can be a whole nother artist in her future. No, actually, she's now just been moved to my label um, within Sony. So it's exciting. Wow. That song is the first of many to come. Wow. Yeah. And, and I look forward to the ones that are to come because that, that really is an outstanding tune. And uh, I have to ask you about, um, you, you do a, a cover of Rising to the Top, Kenny Burke. Um, yeah, what, what made you choose that particular tune? Uh, growing up in Queens, New York, mm. that actually, um, the, it's almost like an anthem. It's the song that whenever I travel around the world, if I listen to that song or Nas's New York State of Mind, it makes me feel like I'm back home. Yeah. It's something that inspires me in that way. So I'm looking at the uh, song almost as an anthem to my childhood, but I was just really happy to get the orchestra to be able to play it. That was just inspir inspirational for me and myself. Wow. So, so Rising to the Top is the New York equivalent then of Light of the World's London Town to, to us here in London. Yeah, I get it. I, I absolutely get yeah, it. It's just something that feels great. If you go to Queens, New York, in, in most areas, you know, there'll be the hippest record that's playing that's this week's whatever it is. But definitely in Jamaica, Queens, where I grew up, if you play Rising to the Top and start it pretty much the way I did, you're going to get the same excitement that you would get off of a Beyonce record or the hype is, I don't even know what record they're comparing to, but just whatever the hypest record is, you'll get the best. Yeah, well, that's, that's great. And you, you only get that story speaking to artists such as yourself, and that's, that's lovely. Uh, thank you very much for sharing that. And then uh, one in the chamber, the title track, uh, Akon on the vocals there. Um, you know, what was, what was kind of behind that? We had a little bit of it earlier, but uh, if you could tell us just a little more about your choice and, uh, and the arrangement on that. Yeah, I mean, that track is actually something I came up with when I was working with CeeLo because I did a lot of the Lady Killer album, um, you know, string arrangement-wise and kind of executive producing it at a point. So I was the idea and the track I had, and then when Akon I've been friends with for years, and he basically is part of the Fuji's extended family. Mm -hmm. So when I um, sat down with him, I actually had a story that a friend of mine was going through something, you know, he went messing with a girl that he shouldn't have. And, you know, she called him up and he went over and then the girl got pregnant and now the girl had one in the chamber. So when I was telling Akon the story, then the music started playing, you know, the song fell, the conversation fell into being the song, basically. Wow. 
That's a great story. Thank you very much for that. And then you uh, pluck Neo out of the ether on everything I need. I mean, uh, another fantastic track. Can we, can we ask you a little more about that? Yeah, I was working with Neo on one of his albums. I mean, he and I have actually written a whole lot of songs together. Um, not many of them have come out in a certain way yet, but it was just something where I'd actually played him some of the strings off of Prognosis. I have a song on Prognosis called Emancipation Inauguration or something like that. Mm. Inauguration Emancipation, one way or another. But either way, I played him the strings and he was inspired. So the whole beginning of the song up to the first chorus, I just played him the strings. He was like, hey, I got an idea. Neil's a brilliant writer and he's also very fast. So he just sat down and wrote basically the start of the song. So I listened to it and the way the song felt inspired me. So I went back and then added the rhythm section to it and put the pieces. So that's actually a song where the orchestra was done first. Then Neo wrote to the, just the orchestra, and then the rhythm section, based on what he was doing, I sat down and built it up. Wonderful, wonderful. And then um, we go to a Beatles track, um, Eleanor Rigby, but, I mean, it's, it's a great cover, and I just love that rim shot backbeat. Um, that's inspired. But, you know, how did you think of that? It sounds so good. Um... Well, when I went to Prague initially the first time as well, I was also <clears throat> experimenting to see, you know, all the records I love, where did the, um, what type of recording, like I needed to know, I wanted to know for myself, if I wanted to get this Isaac Hayes type of sound, while well, I go to this type of room and I get this type of size group and this is what it'll be. So with the Beatles, I felt like that was a smaller group than the Rodolphinum 60 piece section I did. Yes, yeah. So I actually, um, got the uh, what did I do? I got that put together but rather than you know because Eleanor Rigby is one of my favorite songs but rather than leaving it on the downbeat during the verses I had the strings play on the upbeat kind of like a ska feeling yeah. so I, mean, I was laughing because you know of course these are all charted out things with orchestras and the orchestra didn't know what they were doing they were just playing it as it's written so I was like ha 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 look I made a Eleanor Rigby little ska piece but then when I thought about different people that maybe could vocal against it, Stephen Marley is a good friend of mine. He lives around the corner from me in Miami. So then one day I was like, hey, um, you kind of Eleanor Rigby? And he's like, yeah. And actually, I like the Ray Charles version a lot, too. And I was like, okay, cool. So you know what? I sent it to him. And then just as soon as he started singing on it, I was like, whoa, this actually is something super special. And then I went back afterwards and put the drums and bass on it to kind of give it something there that... Um, pushed it to the next little level but in general i just love the idea of having him sing against that with the slightest undertone of being different but still the same wonderful wonderful so do you have a favorite from the album i know that's not a good question to ask an artist because every artist uh, loves every tune they make but uh, is there one that stands out for you for me my go-to right off the top is making it hard for me mm. um I love the way that it is orchestral. It kind of touches a bit of that, but it touches on the jazz vibe as well, which I'm really into. It kind of has a bit of Green Dolphin Street meets a bossa nova backbeat that drops into a soul beat that drops back into a Marvin Gaye feeling type of bridge. Like it touches a whole lot of stuff for me. And then it feels Curtis Mayfield like. So that feels like for me, it's really Charles Stephanie esque. And it really feels like Chicago, but it also just for me musically touches so many other little pieces, you know, from the top to the bottom. That is it. And, you know, ultimately it's the orchestra, Corin and myself playing on that. So it really just feels like it's my energy. Wow. Thank, thank you for describing that so, so nicely as well. So um, what, what are you, what, what's the current project or what's the next project then? Have you, have you got one in mind or uh, are you... You're just sort of building up to it. What's what's happening there? Like a stack of projects. And I guess my challenge with this was how to set up the first one. So now that I've honed in to having the first one in place, you know, I want to take the songs on this album and get them exposed and let just people hear them and share it as music. And then I'll go back and decide what's my next batch. But it's almost as if I was putting together a playlist and a set because I create all the time and I've created for so many years. That it's just you know waiting for the right time to share all these different ideas. So for me, there'll be another album and then a couple other projects that maybe spin off of the different vibes within this. 
Wonderful. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm loving ev- everything on this album. And, um, you know, we, 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 we put it, in, it into rotation. We've already played a couple of pieces from it. And, uh, of course, around your feature, we're going to uh, play a whole lot more of it. You know, the whole album will get played across the week, which we're very, very, you know, very, very excited about. And I, um, I was going to ask you, uh, I'm conscious that we're taking up a, a lot of your time, so I hope, hope we're not taking up too much. But... Um, mm-hmm. I wanted to ask you, is there any uh, thing you'd like to say to the listeners here in the UK and indeed across the world and uh, also to point them at your social media, websites, etc., and where they can come and buy your music? Oh, for sure. I mean, um, you know, my, I'm really easy online to find at Salam Rain Me on Twitter, at Salam, no, actually, at Salam Rain Me on Twitter, uh, Salam Rain Me on Instagram, SalamRainMe.com is the website. Salam Remy on Facebook. Um, I look the same across all of them, so somehow you'll be able to piece out which one is really me. <laughs> and, um, you know, in general, I-, I love the fact that, like, I see a lot of things online. I see a lot of uh, artists, you know, this is something that didn't exist 25 years ago when I was really getting into it. So I just say for creative people and people that like music, there's a whole community of us just gathering up. So, you know, I'm hoping to become one of the places that people look to to just get great quality music and things that are culturally and uh, inspirational, culturally moving and then also inspirational so that they can actually, you know, look for more. That's what it is. I feel like music is a healing process and, you know, to keep that going is great. Definitely, definitely, and um, you, you've contributed um, through through your uh, musical career so far so much to to that. You know, uh, I, and I, I was reading through the people that you'd worked with, the the uh, actual tunes that you'd been involved with, the production on, the writing on, the arrangements on, and the list is endless. I mean, it, it goes on and on, and. Uh, you know, I, I was just thinking, wow, uh, you, you must be incredibly proud of those achievements. Um, I am, but the reality is that, you know, even with, like, platinum plaques and stuff like that, I didn't ever get it for years. I didn't really look at it, and I, I love the fact that I've worked with so many different things, but I still was up at 5 a.m. this morning after getting off a of red eye last night. So I look at it like, what can I do today? And at some point, all of those things stand up, but most of all, I just want to have great relationships with great people and have great music to talk about. And I think that that's really what stands up more than just the achievement of you made a record and it sold this many and these things or that. I think it's just really having a great energy and keeping great energy and great music flowing. The rest will work out. Yeah, and I, and I do feel, you know, with yourself after talking to you today, you know, that all comes from the heart. So from my point of view, it's no wonder. You know, when, when something comes from the heart, it just has such a bigger effect, in my view. Totally, totally. And that's where I'm at. Like, you know, if I didn't make another record, I'm enjoying what I've done before. But then I just like to go places and listen to music. I like to listen to live. You know, I'm the guy standing in, you know, the train station just listening to a sax player play and getting vibes off of that. I just like listening and enjoying that space. That's wonderful. Um, Salam, before I, I say goodbye and thank you very much for sparing us your time, is there anything else you'd like to uh, say to the listeners here in the UK and across the world um, before we say goodbye? Um, like I said, peace and love. Just continue to enjoy music and share as much as you can. That's wonderful. Well, thank you very much indeed for your time today. It's been absolutely lovely speaking to you and hopefully it won't be too long before we speak again. And um, have a wonderful rest of your day and, uh, and peace and, and love to you. All right. Thank you. Take care. Thank you very much.